sense and sensibility. Chapter 1 The Dashwoods The Dashwoods lived in the southern English town of Sussex for many generations. They owned a large country house named Norland Park. The head of the family was old Mr. Dashwood, an elderly unmarried gentleman. During the last years of Mr. Dashwood's life, he invited his nephew, Henry Dashwood, and his family to move into Norland Park. Henry Dashwood had one son, John, by his first wife, and three daughters by his present wife. John was a young man who had received a large inheritance from his mother. The Norland fortune was not as important to John as it was to his sisters, who had little money of their own. When old Mr. Dashwood died, Henry learned that his uncle had not left the fortune to him, but rather for him to use during his lifetime. When Henry died, the inheritance would pass to his son John, and then to John's son. This was because old Mr. Dashwood had been especially fond of John's son. But out of kindness, the old man left Henry's daughters one thousand pounds each. Henry wanted the fortune for his wife and daughters, but if he invested his money carefully, he would have enough to provide for them. Unfortunately, Henry suddenly died, unable to complete his plan. At this time, all that was left for his wife and daughters was ten thousand pounds. Shortly before his death, Henry begged his son John to take care of his stepmother and sisters. John did not have strong feelings for them, but he promised he would make them comfortable. He was not a bad man, but he was selfish and cold-hearted. His wife Fanny was even more selfish and cold-hearted than him. As soon as Henry was buried, Fanny came to Norland Park uninvited. She rudely informed Mrs. Dashwood and her daughters that Norland Park was now hers and that they were her guests. The recently widowed Mrs. Dashwood was terribly offended. She would have left the estate immediately if her eldest daughter had not begged her to reconsider. Eleanor was the eldest daughter. She possessed great intelligence and common sense. She was only 19 but she frequently advised her mother on important matters. Eleanor had an excellent sense of self-control, which her mother and her younger sister Marianne lacked. Like Eleanor, Marianne was generous, clever, and sensitive. But she had very strong emotions, which she was unable to hide. She was much like her mother. The youngest sister, Margaret, was a sweet 13-year-old who shared Marianne's emotional sensibility, but none of her intelligence. One day, John Dashwood reminded his wife of the promise he'd made to his dying father and said he wanted to give each of his sisters one thousand pounds. However, Fanny disapproved of this gift. You'll be taking three thousand pounds out of our son's future inheritance, she said. And you're only related to them by half-blood. They are hardly even your sisters. I must do something for them when they leave Norland for a new home. Perhaps I should give them five hundred pounds each, replied John. That's too much, argued Fanny. You're very generous, but I think they'll be able to live very comfortably on the ten thousand pounds your father left them. That's true, replied John. Why don't I just give my stepmother one hundred pounds every year? Yes, but I don't think your father meant for you to give them any money at all, replied Fanny. I think he wanted you to find them a small, comfortable house to live in, to help them move, and perhaps to send them an occasional basket of fish or meat. They don't need a carriage or horses, and only one or two servants. It would be foolish to give them any more. I think you're absolutely right, said John. Now I understand what my father meant. He decided to offer the assistance his wife suggested. Meanwhile, Henry's widow, Mrs. Dashwood, wanted to leave Norland as soon as possible. 
Mrs. Dashwood had come to strongly dislike her daughter-in-law. The only reason she stayed at Norland was because her eldest daughter, Eleanor, had formed a strong relationship with Fanny's brother, Edward Ferrars. Edward's father had died and left behind a lot of money, but Edward was not sure if he would receive the large inheritance. It depended on his mother's wishes. But Mrs. Dashwood didn't care about his money. He and her daughter seemed to love each other. Edward Ferrars was not handsome or especially gentlemanly. He was shy with a kind heart. His mother and sister wanted him to be a great man in society, but he was not ambitious. All he wanted were the comforts and quietness of private life. His younger brother Robert had greater potential. Edward and Eleanor will most likely be married in a few months, Mrs. Dashwood told Marianne. Don't you approve of Edward? He has no fire in his eyes. He doesn't seem to have any taste in books or music. Oh, how will I ever find a man I can truly love? Worried Marianne. You're only 17, laughed Mrs. Dashwood. It's too early for you to lose hope. Eleanor had a very high opinion of Edward, but she was not sure she wanted to marry him. He often seemed strangely depressed, and she feared he thought of her only as a friend. But Marianne and her mother had no such doubts. They believed love could solve all problems. Marianne thought it was terrible when her sister described her feelings for Edward as respect rather than love. Like him? Respect him? Oh, cold-hearted Eleanor, why are you ashamed to express your love? Fanny also noticed the attachment between her brother and Eleanor. It made her uneasy. She told her mother-in-law, Mrs. Dashwood, My mother and I expect Edward to marry well. It would be dangerous for Eleanor to try and trap Edward into marrying her. This made Mrs. Dashwood furious. She decided that she and her daughters must leave Norland immediately. On that same day, she received a letter from a distant relative of hers named Sir John Middleton. He wrote to offer her a small house near his estate in Devonshire. His letter was so welcoming that Mrs. Dashwood wrote a letter to accept his offer right away. Mrs. Dashwood was happy to inform John and Fanny that she and her daughters would be leaving Norland to live in Devonshire. Edward Ferrars, who was in the room at that time, turned quickly toward her and said, Devonshire? That's so far from here. Yes, she replied. We'll be in Barton, four miles from the city of Exeter. It's only a cottage, but I hope you'll all visit us there. Mrs. Dashwood's invitation to Edward was very affectionate, as she did not want to discourage his relationship with her Eleanor. Barton Cottage was furnished and ready for them to move in at once. Eleanor recommended her mother to sell their carriage and horses and to have only three servants. On his deathbed, Henry had told his wife of John's promise to care for her and her daughters. But as they left, it looked as if John would not offer any assistance. In fact, John was heard to complain about money and how he was in need of more himself. The sisters cried when they said goodbye to their beloved home, Norland. Dear, dear Norland! cried Marianne while walking alone in the park on their last evening. I will miss you for the rest of my life! During their journey to Devonshire, the sisters were too miserable to enjoy the trip. But as they entered Barton Valley, they became more cheerful. They took notice of the countryside where they would live. Barton Valley consisted of thick woods, clear streams, and expansive open fields. Barton Cottage was in excellent condition. There were two sitting rooms, four bedrooms, and two servants' quarters. It was much smaller and poorer than Norland, but the girls made their best efforts to be happy. The next day, the Dashwoods received a visit from their landlord, Sir John Middleton. He was a good-looking, cheerful man. He welcomed them and offered them anything from his house and garden. His house was called Barton Park. He tried to make them as comfortable as possible and said he hoped they would come and visit his family soon. They went to Barton Park for dinner the next day. The estate was half a mile from their cottage. It was a large, stately house where the Middletons lived in great comfort. 
Sir John was a sportsman who enjoyed shooting, while Lady Middleton was a mother who spoiled her children. Sir John was a hospitable man and always had relatives or friends staying at their house. The noisier and more full of young people, the better. Barton Park was famous for its summer parties and winter dances. On the night the Dashwoods arrived for dinner, Sir John apologized that there were no handsome young male guests to meet them. The only guests were Colonel Brandon, a friend staying at the house, and Sir John's mother-in-law, Mrs. Jennings. Mrs. Jennings was a fat, cheerful old lady who talked and laughed a great deal. Colonel Brandon was silent, serious, and handsome. Eleanor and Marianne noticed he was an old bachelor on the wrong side of 35. After dinner, Marianne sang and played the piano. While Sir John was loud in showing his delight for the music, Colonel Brandon was quiet and listened attentively. Mrs. Jennings was a widow with a comfortable fortune. She had seen both of her daughters marry respectably and now had nothing better to do than to try and marry off the rest of the world. She spent a lot of time matching young people with one another and planning their weddings. Mrs. Jennings informed the Middletons and the Dashwoods that Colonel Brandon was very much in love with Marianne. She felt it would be an excellent marriage because he was rich and she was beautiful. How cruel for Mrs. Jennings to say that! remarked Marianne. Colonel Brandon is old enough to be my father. But I cannot think of a man five years younger than me being as ancient as you say, replied Mrs. Dashwood. But didn't you hear him complaining of his bad back? said Marianne. <laughs> my child, laughed Mrs. Dashwood. It must seem amazing to you that I've lived to the great age of forty. Thirty-five has nothing to do with marriage. For example, a woman of twenty-seven could easily consider marrying a man of Colonel Brandon's age. But a woman of twenty-seven could consider becoming his nurse if her house is uncomfortable and her fortune is small. It would be a marriage of convenience. It seems a little hard, remarked Eleanor, to accuse Colonel Brandon of needing nursing just because he complained of a pain in his shoulder on a cold, wet day. But Marianne's view about the colonel did not change. After Eleanor left the room, Marianne said, Mother, I'm concerned about Edward Ferrars. I'm worried he is sick. We've been here two weeks, and he hasn't come to see Eleanor. Be patient, my daughter, Mrs. Dashwood answered. I don't expect him so soon, and Eleanor doesn't either. It is so strange, exclaimed Marianne. How cold and calm their last goodbyes were. Eleanor is so self-controlled, never sad or restless or miserable. I don't understand her. Chapter 2 A Handsome Stranger The Dashwood sisters were finally beginning to feel comfortable at Barton Cottage. They enjoyed taking walks and practicing music for the first time since their father died. They didn't have many visitors, and there were few other houses within walking distance. The only nearby place was a large mansion, Allenham, a mile away. They heard the owner was an old lady named Mrs. Smith, who wasn't well enough to have visitors. One day, despite Eleanor's warning of rain, Marianne and Margaret walked up a hill behind the cottage. At the top, they were delighted at the blue sky and white clouds. They laughed as the wind blew their hair, and Marianne cried, This is the greatest place in the world! But within minutes, dark clouds rolled in and rain poured down. The girls ran down the hill as fast as they could, Margaret was ahead and didn't see Marianne slip and fall. At this time, a gentleman out hunting saw her accident and ran to help her. Her ankle was twisted so she couldn't stand. The gentleman carried her to Barton Cottage. There he placed her on the sofa. Eleanor and her mother were shocked when the stranger entered the house carrying Marianne. They both noticed his handsome appearance. He apologized for a rude entrance 
and Mrs. Dashwood expressed her gratitude for his helping Marianne. She asked his name. It was Willoughby. He presently lived at Allenham. He said he would visit them tomorrow to check on Marianne. Mrs. Dashwood said he would always be welcome at the cottage. Then he left into the pouring rain. Eleanor and her mother admired the man, but Marianne had barely seen him due to her condition. She imagined her hero so intensely that she didn't feel the pain of her injured ankle. When Sir John visited them, he was asked if he knew Willoughby of Allenham. Willoughby, of course, he exclaimed. He visits us every year. I shall invite him to dinner on Thursday. What sort of man is he? asked Mrs. Dashwood. He's a good man, he shoots well, and he's the best horseman in England. They demanded more personal details. Sir John told them Willoughby had no house in Devonshire. He stayed with his relative, Mrs. Smith, at Allenham when he visited. He also said Willoughby would probably inherit the old lady's fortune. Marianne's rescuer visited the next morning. Willoughby became very comfortable with the Dashwoods. The fire in Marianne's eyes seemed to draw him in. They shared many interests and spoke without shyness. By the end of his visit, they talked like old friends. Willoughby visited Barton Cottage every day afterward. At first, he pretended to worry about Marianne's health. But he soon stopped pretending and openly enjoyed Marianne's company. They read and sang and talked together. Marianne thought Willoughby possessed all of the sensibility and taste Edward Ferrars lacked. Soon after, she came to believe that he was perfect for her. Willoughby seemed to feel the same way. Mrs. Dashwood secretly congratulated herself on a great future son-in-law. Meanwhile, Eleanor began to pity Colonel Brandon, who couldn't compete for Marianne's affection with a young man of 25. It bothered Eleanor that Marianne and Willoughby took pleasure in laughing at Brandon. Eleanor was not as happy. She found no companion to take her mind away from missing her friends in Sussex. The only person she could talk to was Colonel Brandon, who liked talking about Marianne. I see your sister is not fond of second attachments, said Brandon. All of her opinions are romantic. She believes we only fall in love once in our lives. I hope she'll become more sensible. That may happen, continued Brandon. I knew a young lady once who... He suddenly stopped, thinking he had said too much. Eleanor felt sure that his story was of disappointed love. Her pity for him grew. The next day, Margaret said to Eleanor, I have a secret. Last night, I saw Willoughby begging Marianne for a lock of hair. She cut it off and gave it to him. He kissed it and put it in his pocket. Eleanor guessed they were now secretly engaged. She was surprised they had not told anybody. The following day, Sir John planned a trip for everyone to a house called Whitwell, owned by Colonel Brandon's brother-in-law. A large group of them packed picnic lunches and prepared to leave. But as the people ate breakfast, a letter came for the colonel. He looked at it and explained to the group that he had urgent business. Their excursion was cancelled. They tried to convince him to put off his business, but he wouldn't. After Brandon left, they decided to ride around the countryside. Marianne got into Willoughby's carriage, and the two were not seen for the rest of the day. The next morning, Mrs. Dashwood went to visit Lady Middleton with two of her daughters. Marianne stayed home since Willoughby would be coming for a visit. When Mrs. Dashwood and her daughters returned home, they were not surprised to find Willoughby's carriage in front of the cottage. They went inside and Marianne came rushing out of the sitting room, sobbing uncontrollably. Then she ran upstairs. Mrs. Dashwood asked Willoughby, Is she ill? No, he answered, trying to look cheerful. But I have bad news. My cousin, Mrs. Smith, has sent me to London on business. I won't be able to visit any more. I'm poor and depend on Mrs. Smith. I must do as she asks. I've come to say goodbye. Well, I hope you won't be gone long, said Mrs. Dashwood. I'm afraid I won't be back this year. He replied, his face reddening. 
Mrs. Dashwood looked at Eleanor with surprise. Eleanor was just shocked. Willoughby said goodbye and rushed out to his carriage. Then he was gone. Eleanor was worried about her sister, whose emotional nature would encourage her misery. Later that day, Mrs. Dashwood told Eleanor that Mrs. Smith probably sent Willoughby away because she disapproved of his engagement to Marianne. He'll return to Barton as soon as he can. Why would they hide their engagement from us? questioned Eleanor. Dear child, scolded her mother, it is strange for you to accuse Willoughby and Marianne of hiding their feelings. You have accused them of showing their feelings too openly in the past. Do you prefer to believe he has bad intentions toward Marianne rather than good? I hope not, cried Eleanor. I hope there is a simple explanation for his strange behavior this morning. Nobody saw Marianne until dinner. At the table, she was so upset she couldn't eat or look at anyone. And when someone mentioned anything connected with Willoughby, she burst into tears. As the days passed, Marianne got worse and worse. A week later, her sisters persuaded her to go for a walk. While walking, they saw a gentleman riding toward them. It's Willoughby! I know it is! cried Marianne. She ran toward the carriage. It was not Willoughby, but Edward Ferrars, the only person in the world she could forgive for not being Willoughby. She stopped and smiled, holding back her tears. As Edward and Eleanor exchanged greetings, Marianne saw their polite yet distant behavior. When they returned to the cottage, Mrs. Dashwood greeted Edward warmly. So, Edward, what are your mother's plans for you these days? Does she still want you to be a politician? No, replied Edward. She knows I could never do that. We'll never agree on a profession for me. I've always wanted to work for the church, but that's too ordinary for my family. I know you're not ambitious, Edward, said Mrs. Dashwood. No, I wish to be like everybody else, to be perfectly happy in my own way. Greatness won't make me happy. You're right, cried Marianne. What does wealth or greatness have to do with happiness? Greatness has very little to do with it, said Eleanor. But wealth has much to do with it. Eleanor, cried Marianne. Money only gives happiness where there is nothing else to give it. Beyond answering our basic needs, it's of no use at all. How much do you need for your basic needs? asked Eleanor. Two thousand per year, said Marianne. No more than that. Eleanor laughed. <laughs> Two thousand. One thousand a year would be wealthy to me. A family cannot live on less than two thousand per year, said Marianne. It takes that much to have enough servants, plus a carriage and horses for riding. Eleanor smiled at her sister's description of her future life with Willoughby. During Edward's visit, Eleanor showed her usual politeness and interest. But she was alarmed by his coldness toward her. He was clearly unhappy, and she doubted whether he still loved her. She could see he was confused. The next day, while having tea, Marianne noticed a ring on Edward's finger. I've never seen that before, Edward. Is that your sister's hair in the ring? Edward blushed deeply and, looking quickly at Eleanor, answered, Yes, it's Fanny's hair. It looks lighter than it really is. Eleanor was sure that he had taken some of her hair without her knowing. Chapter 3 Secrets Sir John soon had more visitors at Barton Park. He had recently met two young ladies with the family name Steele, who were his distant cousins. He had invited them to visit and they had accepted immediately. The Dashwood sisters came to Barton Park to meet Sir John's new guests. They found the Steele sisters polite and elegant. The elder sister Anne looked very plain, but the younger sister Lucy was a beautiful 23-year-old lady. Miss Dashwood, asked the elder Miss Steele, 
Do you like Devonshire? You must have been sorry to leave beautiful Norland. Eleanor was surprised that the Steeles knew about her family. Yes, Norland is a lovely place. You must have had many handsome bachelors there, added Anne. Good heavens, Anne, cried Lucy. All you think and talk about is men. Eleanor was glad when their meeting was finished. She found the elder Steel sisters' conversation too vulgar, and the younger sister Lucy too clever for her taste. The Steeles thought differently, and soon the young ladies were together for an hour or two every day. Sir John told the Steeles everything about the Dashwoods' lives. One day, Anne Steele congratulated Eleanor on Marianne's engagement to a very fine young man. Then the Steeles told Eleanor that Sir John talked about her suspected attachment to Edward. His name is Ferrars, whispered Sir John. But it's a big secret. Mr. Ferrars, repeated Anne Steele. Your sister-in-law's brother? He's a very pleasant young man. We know him well. How can you say that, Anne? cried Lucy, who always corrected everything her sister said. We've only seen him once or twice at my uncle's house. Eleanor was shocked. She wanted to know who their uncle was and how they knew Edward, but she didn't ask questions. During the next few days, Lucy took every chance to make conversation with Eleanor. She was a clever and humorous companion, but Eleanor pitied her for lacking education. She disliked the insincerity, dishonesty, and self-interest that lay behind her words and actions. While Eleanor and Lucy were walking alone, Lucy asked, "You may think this question strange, but do you know your sister-in-law's mother, Mrs. Ferrars?" The question was strange to Eleanor. "I've never met her," she answered coldly. "Then you couldn't say what kind of woman she is?" questioned Lucy. "No," Eleanor plainly replied, holding back her true opinion of Edward's mother. "I don't know anything about her." Then Lucy looked at Eleanor. "I wish I could tell you about the difficult situation I'm in." "Well, I wish I could help you, but I don't know Mrs. Ferrars." "Mrs. Ferrars knows nothing of me," Lucy said with a shy, sidelong glance at Eleanor. "But we will be closely connected soon." "Good Lord!" cried Eleanor. "Do you mean with Mr. Robert Ferrars?" She didn't like the idea of Lucy becoming her sister-in-law. No," replied Lucy. "Not Robert. I've never met him in my life. I mean his elder brother, Edward." Eleanor was silent with shock. "You must be surprised," said Lucy, "because he never mentioned our relationship to your family. I know Edward won't be angry that I've told you our secret. He trusts you so much and looks upon you and your family almost as sisters." Eleanor forced herself to remain calm. May I ask how long you have been engaged? We've been engaged for four years now," she answered. Eleanor couldn't believe it. We met here in Devonshire while Edward was studying law," said Lucy. "I didn't want to get engaged without his mother's approval, but I was young and loved him so much. Oh, dear Edward, look! I carry his picture everywhere." She pulled a small painting of Edward from her pocket and showed it to Eleanor. Her heart sank. "You can't imagine my suffering," continued Lucy. "We see each other so infrequently." She put her hand to her eyes. Eleanor was unsympathetic. "Sometimes I think about breaking it off," continued Lucy. "But I couldn't bear hurting him. What do you think?" "You must decide for yourself," answered Eleanor. Poor Edward doesn't even have my picture," Lucy went on. "But I sent him a ring with a lock of my hair in it. Did you see him wearing it when he visited you recently?" "I did," Eleanor answered. Her calm voice concealed her great unhappiness. She was shocked, confused, and miserable. Their conversation ended, and Eleanor was sure Edward still cared for her. She felt he loved her and would never have intentionally deceived her. He was trapped by a beautiful yet insincere, vulgar, selfish girl. Her interest lay in his future income.
Eleanor was very careful to hide her unhappiness. She knew if she told her family the bad news about Edward, their misery would only add to her own. On several occasions, she spoke quietly with Lucy about the situation. Eleanor learned that Lucy planned to hold Edward to the engagement. She was jealous that Edward held Eleanor in such high esteem. Why else would Lucy tell Eleanor her secret but to warn her to keep away from Edward? What made Eleanor most sad was that she knew Edward did not love his future wife. He had no chance of having a happy marriage. Mrs. Jennings, who was making plans to return to her London house, surprised Eleanor and Marianne with an invitation. You must come along, she told the Dashwood sisters. I'm so good at finding husbands for single girls. If I can't get at least one of you married, it won't be my fault. Eleanor wanted to refuse. She feared she might run into Edward and Lucy Steele in London. But Marianne was excited at the chance of seeing Willoughby, who was still in London. Mrs. Dashwood insisted that they accept the invitation. When Eleanor and Marianne got to their room in Mrs. Jennings' luxurious house in London, both girls took out their pens and paper for letter writing. I'm writing home to Mother, said Eleanor to Marianne. Perhaps you should hold off a few days. I'm not writing to Mother, replied Marianne. Eleanor realized her sister was writing to Willoughby. Marianne was nervous for the rest of the evening. She could eat almost nothing and anxiously listen to the sound of every passing carriage. After dinner, there was a knock on the door. Marianne jumped up and cried, It must be Willoughby! She ran toward the door and almost threw herself into the arms of Colonel Brandon. Her shock was too great to bear with calmness. She left the room and Eleanor greeted the colonel. Eleanor was sorry to see the man so in love with her sister. He experienced only her bitter disappointment when she saw him. The colonel asked, Is she ill? Eleanor made several excuses about tiredness and headaches. Mrs. Jennings entered the room cheerfully and asked the colonel where he had been. The colonel replied politely, but gave no definitive answer. He soon left and all of the ladies went to bed early. The next day found Marianne cheerfully hoping to see Willoughby. She was terribly distracted all day. When the ladies returned from shopping, there was still no answer from Willoughby. After being at Mrs. Jennings' house for a week, Marianne finally saw Willoughby's card on the table when they came home from a ride. He's been here while we were out, exclaimed Marianne. From then on, she stayed at home while the others went out. When a letter came the next day, Marianne tried to grab it, but it was for Mrs. Jennings. Were you expecting a letter? Asked Eleanor, who could see her sister's disappointment. Just a little, sighed Marianne. Dear sister, don't you trust me? Asked Eleanor. How can you, who trusts in no one, ask me that? Replied Marianne. I have nothing to tell, Eleanor blustered, wanting to reveal the secret of Lucy Steele's engagement to Edward. Nor do I, replied Marianne. You communicate nothing, and I hide nothing. The next day, there was a dance at Lady Middleton's London home. When Marianne realized Willoughby wasn't there, she lost interest in the festivities. She was hurt that Willoughby was invited, but hadn't come. One night, the two Dashwood sisters went to a party with Lady Middleton. Willoughby was there, standing with an elegant young lady. Marianne was delighted when she saw him. She began to run to him, but Eleanor stopped her. Be calm, said Eleanor. Hide your feelings. It was impossible for Marianne. She sat with anxiety and impatience written on her face. Why won't he look at me? cried Marianne. Finally, Willoughby turned around and looked at them. Marianne jumped up and held her hand out to him. He came over and spoke to Eleanor, not Marianne, asking about their mother's health. Marianne blushed and cried, Willoughby, why didn't you visit me? I visited, he said. But you weren't home. Haven't you received my letters? She said with wild anxiety. 
There must have been some terrible mistake. I beg you to tell me, what's the matter? Willoughby looked ashamed, glancing over at the young lady he had been standing next to earlier. Yes, I received the information that you were in town. Thank you for it. With that, he turned away to join a friend. Marianne was pale and unable to stand. Eleanor helped her into a chair. Willoughby left the party soon after. Riding home, Eleanor realized that Marianne's attachment with Willoughby was over. She felt bitter over his tasteless manner of ending it. That night, Eleanor was kept awake by the sound of Marianne's sobbing. The next day, a letter arrived for Marianne. Mrs. Jennings asked if it was a love letter. I've never seen a woman so in love in my life. I hope he won't keep her waiting. When Eleanor went into their room, Marianne was sobbing violently. Eleanor held her hand and burst into tears, too. Then she read his letter. Dear Madam, I beg your forgiveness if you didn't approve of my behavior last night. I will always remember our visits with great fondness. I hope I didn't give you the impression that I felt more for you than I ever expressed. Please, understand that I've been engaged to someone else for a long time. We will be married soon. With this letter, I am returning the lock of your hair that you so kindly offered me. Your friend, John Willoughby. Eleanor was disgusted with the cold, official manner of this letter. It was hurtful and cruel. In an instant, she was glad that Marianne would not wed such a terrible man. Oh, Eleanor, said Marianne, I'm sorry to make you so unhappy. Just think how much you would have suffered if you'd discovered how terrible he was at the end of your engagement, replied Eleanor. Engagement? cried Marianne. We were never engaged. He never promised me anything. He said he loved you, questioned Eleanor. No, he never said so, cried Marianne. But I could feel it in his eyes. <laughs> she began sobbing again. Later, Mrs. Jennings showed concern for Marianne, who had made herself sick. She told them that Willoughby's other woman was Miss Gray, with an income of 50,000 pounds per year, and that Willoughby spent too much money on his carriage and horses and needed money very badly. She thought his behavior was terrible, but cheerfully she said that it was all for the best because now Marianne could marry Colonel Brandon. Chapter 4 The Truth Revealed Marianne felt more miserable the next day. She was determined to avoid Mrs. Jennings. Her kindness is not sympathy, she complained. She enjoys gossiping about my problems to her friends. After breakfast, Mrs. Jennings found the sisters in their room and delivered a letter to Marianne. My dear, this will make you happy. Marianne hoped it was from Willoughby, explaining and apologizing for his strange behavior. But it was from her mother. The letter expressed confidence in Willoughby. Marianne began to cry again at the thought of her mother's disappointment when she learned the truth about him. Then there was a knock on the door. It was Colonel Brandon. Marianne ran away to her room. Eleanor greeted him. He seemed unhappy. I've come to speak with you, Brandon said to Eleanor. I want to tell you some details about Mr. Willoughby's character. Your words are proof of your feelings for Marianne, said Eleanor. Perhaps you remember a lady I mentioned once at Barton Park? She was like your sister, with an eager mind, a warm heart, and great sensibility. She was a distant cousin of mine. We played together when we were children, and this grew into love, said Brandon. But at 17, she was married to my brother, against her wishes. Before the wedding, we planned to run away to marry secretly. My father discovered the plan and sent me to the army. Their marriage was unhappy. My brother cheated on her with countless other women. 
Two years later, they were divorced. Eleanor looked upon him with great sympathy and concern. He continued, Three years later, I found her in a debtor's prison. She was terribly sick and had only a short while left to live. I cared for her until she died in my arms. She left a little girl in my care named Eliza. I sent Eliza to school and then left her in the care of a respectable woman in the country. Eliza is now 17. Last year, she suddenly disappeared. She was gone for eight months while I searched for her. Good Lord, cried Eleanor. Could Willoughby be... Remember the day at Barton Park. We were supposed to go on the outing, but I received an urgent letter. I was called away. Willoughby didn't know it was to help someone he'd made poor and miserable. But he wouldn't have cared. He did the worst a man could do. He left a girl he'd seduced, with no home, no friends, and no money. This is an outrage, cried Eleanor. Now you understand what he is like. Imagine how hard it was for me to see your sister's affection for him when I knew of his character. Who knows what his intentions were toward her? One day she will feel grateful when she compares her situation to that of my poor Eliza. Have you seen Willoughby since you left Barton? asked Eleanor. Yes, after Eliza confessed the name of her seducer. I accused him of dishonorable behavior and challenged him to a duel. We met in combat, but both of us returned unwounded. My poor Eliza had her child and now lives in the country. The colonel left. Eleanor told her sister the details of their conversation, but the result was not what she had hoped. Marianne listened attentively and accepted Willoughby's guilt, but she seemed even more saddened that Willoughby's good character was lost as well as his heart. Mrs. Dashwood's letter of reply came the following day. She advised them not to shorten their stay with Mrs. Jennings. A hasty return to Barton would only bring back memories of happy times with Willoughby. Sir John and Mrs. Jennings condemned Willoughby when they heard of his dishonor. They also shared the belief that Eleanor would be the woman to marry Colonel Brandon. Two weeks after Willoughby's letter, Eleanor found out that he had gotten married. Marianne was calm when she first received the news, but later began to sob wildly. At this time, Eleanor unhappily met the Steele sisters who had arrived in London. Lucy pretended to be happy to meet her. Eleanor had to use all of her self-control to remain polite. A more welcome meeting occurred when John Dashwood visited them at Mrs. Jennings. After being introduced to Colonel Brandon, he asked Eleanor to take a walk with him privately. Eleanor, I think I'll be congratulating you on a very respectable marriage soon, said John. Colonel Brandon is most gentlemanly, and I'm sure he likes you. He doesn't wish to marry me, she replied. You're wrong, sister. You can catch him with a little effort. How funny it would be if Fanny had a brother and I had a sister marrying at the same time. Is Mr. Edward Ferrars getting married? Eleanor asked calmly. It's not arranged yet, but he is to wed the Lady Miss Morton. She's Lord Morton's only daughter, with 30,000 pounds of her own. Edward's mother will give him 1,000 pounds per year if he marries her. I wish we could be so comfortable, he said. A week later, John and Fanny Dashwood gave a dinner party. The Middletons, Mrs. Jennings, Colonel Brandon, the Dashwood sisters, and the Steele sisters were all invited. Eleanor and Lucy both knew that Mrs. Ferrars would be there. Oh dear, Miss Dashwood, whispered Lucy as they walked upstairs. In a moment, I'll be seeing the person on whom my happiness depends, my future mother-in-law. Mrs. Ferrars was a small, scrawny woman with a grouchy expression. She clearly disliked Eleanor and approved of Lucy Steele. If only she knew Lucy's secret, mused Eleanor. How she would hate her. The next morning, Lucy bragged to Eleanor about how much Mrs. Ferrars liked her. Before Eleanor could reply, the door opened. Edward walked in. It was an awkward moment between the three of them. Eleanor welcomed him. Lucy kept watch over Eleanor from the corner of her eye. Eleanor decided to leave the couple alone and went to find Marianne. After visiting with his sisters, John Dashwood thought about inviting them to visit Norland for a few days. 
But Fanny Dashwood quickly informed him, I'm shocked by your suggestion. I've just decided to ask the Steele sisters to stay with us. We'll have to ask your sisters some other year. John agreed, and Fanny invited Lucy and her sister. Lucy was very happy for the useful opportunity to be close to Edward. Some days later, Mrs. Jennings came back from her daughter Mrs. Palmer's house with a new piece of gossip. Fanny is ill because her brother Edward has been engaged to Lucy Steele for over a year. Only her sister Anne knew. The Steeles are staying at your brother's house right now. Anne, being a creature of no intelligence, told Fanny. Your sister-in-law fell on the floor sobbing and screaming. The Steele girls were told to pack their bags immediately. The Farrars family wanted Edward to marry that rich Miss Morton. I have no pity for them. I can't stand people who think money and greatness is important. Now all of the talk was about Edward. Eleanor knew Marianne would be angry with him. She decided to tell her sister the truth in preparation. Marianne listened to Eleanor's story in horror and cried continuously. Edward seemed like a second Willoughby. How long have you known? She asked. Lucy told me of her engagement four months ago at Barton. I promised to keep it a secret. All this time you've been caring for me, and you've had this on your heart. How could you put up with it? Cried Marianne. I was just doing my duty. I didn't want to worry everyone replied Eleanor. Four months? And yet you loved him! Yes, but I love my family too, and I don't have any ill will toward Edward. They will marry, and in time he will forget that he ever thought another woman better than her. I'm beginning to understand the way you think. Your self-control doesn't seem so strange anymore. I know you think I lack emotions. This has been on my mind for months. I couldn't tell anyone. The person who destroyed my hopes of happiness told me this. She saw me as a rival and was happy to defeat me. I've had to listen to her talking about Edward again and again and pretend I wasn't interested in him. And I had to endure the unkindness and rudeness of his mother. Surely you can see how I've suffered now. Oh, Eleanor, Marianne cried. How unkind I've been to you. Then the two sisters fell into each other's arms, sobbing. The next day, John Dashwood came to visit them. I suppose you've heard of our shocking discovery, he said. The sisters nodded silently. Your sister-in-law has suffered terribly. So has Mrs. Farrar's. They were both deceived, and after we showed those young women such kindness, Fanny wishes she'd invited you two to visit instead. Poor Mrs. Farrar sent for Edward, and he came to see her. I'm sorry to say what happened next. Our efforts to persuade Edward to end his engagement were useless. His mother offered to give him £1,000 per year to marry Miss Morton, but he refused. Mrs. Farrars told him he would receive no money from her, and she would do her best to prevent him from succeeding in any profession he entered. Good heavens! cried Marianne. It's so terrible! Your shock is understandable, John said to his sisters. His stubbornness is astonishing. Mr. Ferrars has behaved like an honest man, cried Mrs. Jennings, who was listening to them. He must keep his promise to marry Lucy Steele. Madam, I respect your opinion, replied John. But a good woman like Mrs. Ferrars, with such an enormous fortune, cannot approve of her son's secret engagement to an unsuitable woman. Mrs. Ferrars told Edward to leave her house forever. And he did. She never wants to see him again. Robert shall inherit her fortune when she dies. Edward will be poor, while his younger brother is wealthy. I sincerely pity him. John Dashwood soon left, and the three women condemned Mrs. Farrar's behavior and warmly supported Edward. A letter from Lucy came the next morning. Dear Miss Dashwood, as a true friend, I know you will be pleased to hear this. Despite the terrible suffering that Edward and I have been through, we are quite well now, thank God. We are happy in each other's love. Thank you for helping us through our difficulties. Yesterday, we spent two hours together, 
and I offered him his freedom, and was ready to call our engagement off if he desired, but he refused. He said he didn't care about his mother's anger as long as I loved him. Life will not be easy for us, but we must hope for the best. He will enter the church. I hope you can recommend him to somebody who can offer him a job. Please tell dear Mrs. Jennings that I hope she won't forget us either. Please remember me well and send my regards to Sir John and Lady Middleton, their dear children, and give my love to Miss Mary Ann. Yours truly, Lucy Steele. Eleanor was sure that Lucy wanted Mrs. Jennings to see the letter and showed it to her immediately. The old woman praised Lucy's warm heart. She calls me dear Mrs. Jennings. Oh, I wish I could get him a job with all my heart. The Dashwood sisters had been in London for more than two months. Marianne was ready to go home. She missed the country terribly. Eleanor was also anxious to go, but she dreaded the long journey that lay ahead. This problem was solved when the Palmers invited Mrs. Jennings and the Dashwood sisters to their home in Somerset, only a day away from Barton. They accepted the invitation and planned to stay at the Palmers' home for a week. A few days later, Colonel Brandon came to speak with Eleanor. He had a job for Edward. It would be a start for Mr. Farrar's at least, continued Colonel Brandon. The minister's duties there are light, and a cottage comes with the job. I'm sorry for the smallness of the house, and the income is only 200 pounds a year. Eleanor thanked the Colonel and promised to tell Edward the good news. Chapter 5 Back to Barton Before leaving London, Eleanor visited her brother and Fanny. John was interested to hear of Colonel Brandon's job offer to Edward. John took her aside and said, I want to tell you one more thing. Although Mrs. Farrars did not approve of Edward's attachment to you, she would have preferred he marry you than Lucy Steele. Of course, it's too late now. Suddenly, Robert Farrars entered. She had only met the younger Farrars brother once and found him to be a thoughtless and self-important young man. This meeting increased her dislike for him. He talked happily of how he would receive Edward's inheritance and laughed at the idea of Edward being a poor minister who lived in a cottage. I said to my mother, he said, Dear madam, if Edward marries this young woman, I shall never see him again. If I'd known of this country girl earlier, I would have tried to persuade him to break it off. Eleanor was glad she couldn't stay long and hoped she would never see Robert Farrars again. The trip to Cleveland, the Palmer's home in Somerset, took two days. When they arrived, Marianne felt worse than usual. They were only 30 miles away from Willoughby's country house. She planned to spend her time taking lonely walks and delighting in her misery. Colonel Brandon was also a guest of the Palmer's. He spent a great deal of time talking to Eleanor about the repairs he would make to the minister's cottage at Delaford before Edward took up residence there. He talked to her so much that she began to wonder if John Dashwood had been right about the colonel's interest in her. But she still got the feeling that when Colonel Brandon spoke to her, he wished he was talking to Mary Ann. After two evenings of walking in the thick, wet grass, Mary Ann came down with a terrible cold. She felt feverish with soreness all over her body. She refused all medicine, insisting that all she needed was a good night's rest. But by the next day, she was very sick. Eleanor sent for the doctor, who said she suffered from an infection and would recover in a few days. After several days, Mary Ann's condition remained the same. The doctor came every day. Eleanor was hopeful and in letters to her mother didn't mention the seriousness of Mary Ann's illness. That evening, as Eleanor sat beside her sister's bed, Marianne sat up suddenly and cried wildly. Is Mama coming? Not yet, Eleanor replied, hiding her fear and helping Marianne lie down again. Please tell her to come soon, Marianne cried desperately. Or I shall never see her again. Eleanor was so alarmed that she sent for the doctor immediately. Colonel Brandon drove through the night to Barton to fetch Mrs. Dashwood. 
When the doctor came, he admitted that the medicines had failed. The infection was stronger than ever. Eleanor hoped her mother would arrive in time to say goodbye to her dying sister. But by midday, signs of Marianne's fever were going down. Eleanor began to hope that Marianne would survive. On the doctor's next visit, he congratulated her on Marianne's slow recovery. That night, Eleanor slept peacefully, knowing her sister was out of danger. Around 8 o'clock, Eleanor heard a carriage drive up to the front door. She rushed downstairs to meet her mother. But in the sitting room, she found Willoughby. Fearful, she stepped backward. Miss Dashwood, I have something to tell you, begged Willoughby. Eleanor agreed reluctantly. Hurry, I have no spare time. First of all, is your sister out of danger? We hope so, Eleanor replied frigidly. Thank God, I heard she was ill. I want to offer an explanation for my actions. I have not always been a scoundrel. I beg your sister's forgiveness. Marianne has already forgiven you. Really? He cried eagerly. Still, I'll explain. When I first met her, my only intention was to pass my time in Devonshire pleasantly. My debts are great. I was planning to marry a woman of fortune. But I soon found myself falling in love with Marianne. By the time I prepared myself to ask for her hand in marriage, my relative, old Mrs. Smith, discovered my scandalous connection. He blushed and turned away. But you've probably heard that story from Colonel Brandon. I have, said Eleanor, who was also blushing. Willoughby continued. Mrs. Smith was very angry with me, and I suffered. She cut off my money and refused to see me again. I knew that if I married Marianne, I would be poor. So I came to Barton Cottage to say goodbye. I was miserable when I saw her sorrow and disappointment. There was a short silence, and Eleanor softened toward him. Marianne's notes to me were like knives in my heart. She was far dearer to me than Miss Gray, whom I was engaged to. Remember that you are a married man now, said Eleanor. Willoughby laughed wildly. Married, yes. Miss Gray saw Marianne's last letter and was jealous and angry. As punishment, she made me write that terrible letter to Marianne. You have made your choice, Eleanor replied coldly. Respect your wife. My wife doesn't deserve your pity. I have no chance of happiness with her. If I'm ever free again... Eleanor stopped him with a frown. I'll leave now, he said. But I'll live in terror of one event. Your sister's marriage. She can never be more lost to you than she is now, said Eleanor. But she will be gained by someone else. With that, Willoughby ran away. A half hour later, the girl's mother entered the house, half dead with fear. Eleanor gave her the good news. Mrs. Dashwood cried tears of relief. Colonel Brandon shared their relief with his profound silence. Marianne's recovery continued daily. Mrs. Dashwood soon found an opportunity to tell Eleanor other news. On the long drive from Barton, Colonel Brandon told Mrs. Dashwood he could no longer hide his feelings for Marianne. He would ask for her hand in marriage. Mrs. Dashwood, convinced of his excellent character, hoped that in time, Marianne would accept his offer. Marianne recovered quickly and returned to Barton in a week. On the ride home in Colonel Brandon's carriage, Eleanor saw that Marianne was now able to control her feelings. Eleanor was pleased to see her becoming enthusiastic again. A few days later, Marianne confessed to Eleanor, I behaved badly. I was too free with Willoughby and so impolite to other people. I was terrible to you, dear Eleanor. You were suffering too. I thought only of my own broken heart. Eleanor took a deep breath and told Marianne everything Willoughby said to her. Marianne said nothing. Tears ran down her face. That evening, Marianne told her mother and sister, what Eleanor told me was a great relief. I could have never been happy with him, knowing what he did. Happy with a scoundrel like that, cried her mother. Not my Marianne. You are considering the matter like a sensible person, said Eleanor. How foolish I was, cried Marianne. It's all my fault, said Mrs. Dashwood. 
I should have smelled his intentions earlier. Life at Barton became normal again. Eleanor waited for news of Edward. It arrived unexpectedly from Mrs. Dashwood's manservant, Thomas. He returned with a report that Mr. Ferrars was married. Marianne took one look at Eleanor's pale face and burst into sobs. Mrs. Dashwood didn't know which daughter to comfort first. She led Marianne to another room and hurried back to Eleanor who had begun questioning Thomas. Who told you this, Thomas? I saw him myself, with the former Miss Steele. She called to me from a carriage and asked about Marianne's health. Then she smiled and said her name had changed since she was last in Devonshire. Was Mr. Ferrars in the carriage with her? Yes, madam. He was next to her. But I didn't see his face. Did Mrs. Ferrars look happy? asked Eleanor. Yes, madam. Very happy indeed. Thomas was sent away while Eleanor and her mother sat in silence. Mrs. Dashwood felt sad for her. A few days later, a carriage rode up to the front door. <coughs> Eleanor thought it was Colonel Brandon, but it was Edward. I must remain calm, she said to herself. He entered looking pale and nervous. Mrs. Dashwood greeted him kindly and congratulated him. He blushed and mumbled. An awful silence came over the room. Mrs. Dashwood ended it by telling him she hoped Mrs. Ferrars was well. Is Mrs. Ferrars in Delaford? Eleanor bravely asked. Delaford? He said with surprise. My mother is in London. I meant your new wife, Eleanor said. Edward hesitated. Perhaps you mean my brother's new wife. Your brother's new wife? Marianne and her mother repeated together with astonishment. Eleanor couldn't speak. Yes, Edward said. My brother is now married to Miss Lucy Steele. Eleanor ran out of the room and burst into tears of happiness. Edward watched her run away and followed her. The ladies were astonished. When they all sat down for tea, Edward asked for Mrs. Dashwood's permission to marry Eleanor. She said yes. He was the happiest man alive. My foolish engagement would not have happened if my mother had let me choose my own profession. I imagined myself in love. When I met you, Eleanor, I realized how wrong it was. Everyone was delighted. He explained that his brother had visited Lucy, trying to persuade her to break off the engagement with his brother. Lucy realized that Robert, rather than Edward, would inherit his mother's fortune. Since they were both of a similarly selfish character, they became attracted to one another and got married with speed and secrecy. Edward's mother was horrified, but eventually accepted it. She wasn't happy about Edward's engagement to Eleanor either, but she gave them £10,000. The money would allow Edward and Eleanor to marry very soon and move into the minister's cottage at Delaford. They were the happiest couple in the world. Moving to Delaford did not separate Eleanor from her sister. By the time Marianne was 19, with feelings of warm friendship and respect, she agreed to marry Colonel Brandon, a man she had once considered dull and too old. Colonel Brandon was as happy now as everybody else. In time, Marianne came to love him as much as she had loved Willoughby. Mrs. Dashwood kept living at Barton Cottage. As soon as Margaret grew old enough for dancing and parties, she visited Sir John and Mrs. Jennings. Barton and Delaford were connected and filled with strong family affection. Eleanor and Marianne lived very happily with their husbands and were very close to each other. As the years passed, the sisters became ever closer. <laughs>